Alton colleagues, thank you very much for the, especially the faculty of science that is here in full force today. And some of the deans that are also here, thank you very much for your um, attendance. Um, just to put this in perspective, what we do doing during academic week, um, some of you um, might know this, but we have four key priorities that we're pursuing in the period 2016 to 2020. <coughs> and the themes of this year are directly related to those four key priorities. Um, the one is uh, um, around academic excellence and student success. So yesterday, for example, we had a very lively discussion and it, it was, uh, I felt very proud walking out here yesterday uh, uh, when we had student uh, retention and success framework and um, first experience also that we started next year. Um, that, uh, and also the suggestions that we got from those um, the participants here. Yeah. So we're having a suggestion box again today. On Monday, our second key priority is around the university in the digital age. And it is, uh, and so we look at the fourth industrial revolution and the classroom. Well, that was a very interesting uh, um, conversation as well. And our third key priority is around research-led uh, learning and teaching, which is where this project comes in. Project Y and, and Dr. Ms. Coleman will give us more uh, information. This is one of my Apex projects and he's the driver. Uh, assisted by Professor Lona Hoffman, and he'll give some, some input. But I have two important things around research led learning is how do we enhance critical thinking in our students, and um, especially in undergrad students in preparation for postgraduate studies as well, and the research skills that go with that. So that's directly related to um, that key priority. And then our fourth one is about um, <laughs> curriculum transformation and renewal. So tomorrow we will be having a panel discussion on decolonization and organization, etc. Uh, from a couple, just input from a couple of, of panelists. So we've linked the themes with the key priorities um, uh, that we identified in, in the learning and teaching goal 2 um, for the period 2016 to 2020. You have to publish a, a booklet here, but I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Edis that will explain. Um, we are going to also have the two beds <laughs> that we will introduce uh, that will be given, giving us a perspective of um, a mentor and a mentee on this project. And I would like you to put your thinking caps on because this is such an interesting, innovative project that um, if we can think about ways and if you can think about ways in which we can broaden this in the institution, almost in the DNA, and have a couple of faculties that maybe put up their hand to, to, to be further pilots. We have a suggestion box here, so when you make your comments, please also just jot down your notes. You've got some paper here somewhere. Um, you can maybe just distribute that. Jot down your notes so that we can, and we do take into account your suggestions. Um, please then just make sure that you don't leave without uh, giving us your suggestions. Okay, Mark, over to you. Well, thank you all for coming. Those of you who um, came because you thought it was a lecture on AR and VR, um, I do apologize. There is a laboratory across the way which will be open after this lecture, which you can go and see augmented and virtual reality as we are rolling it out in the faculties of science and also EMS uh, in a postgraduate in a postgrad diploma, which we hope to launch uh, quite soon. Okay, on to Project Y, APEX project. Um, the most important thing that we were tasked with was to find ways or to explore ways of enhancing critical and creative thinking and research skills in the undergraduate program. And the DVC kind of answered that question, we need more postgrads. As the university works towards a 70-30 mix, so 70% undergrads, 30% postgrads, we need postgrads that go into the system. We also need postgrads that go into the system well prepared so they can finish within the prerequisite time. Every time a postgrad goes over time, it, uh, the university loses some valuable income. 
that's with all things, the project started with a number of goals, and some of them were rather large and unobtainable. Others turned out to be very good. I think what we had to understand from the very beginning was the negative concept around critical, and you saw that comment, seek a critical mind, fear a critical spirit. A critical mind and a critical spirit are two different things. Critical spirit devalues people, is self-centered, um, tries very hard to push their point across at the expense of everyone else. A critical thinker, however, is there to understand and not to drive a personal agenda. A critical mind is able to evaluate and come up with sensible comment on ideas and actions. So we needed to move away from a negative connotation of critical to one which is inspiring and inspires growth of intellectual pursuit. Um, the most important thing that we thought would make this project work is if we could bring young minds together with some of the very best researchers at the institution who are nationally and internationally recognized so they could have an interaction around the whole process of thinking critically. And that probably was the most successful thing that we were able to achieve um, during the duration of the project. So how do we select the project Y phase one team? It fits a Lorna Holtman through the postgrad office. What we thought is we needed to have students who were undergoing postgrad studies so they knew what research was, who could remember, looking back, what the undergraduate program contained and then start to think, what about the undergraduate program involved critical thinking? Any university program, undergraduate, that doesn't have critical thinking is, is not a university program. So we really need to understand the depth and where there were gaps and how we could possibly use this project to think about ways of fulfilling those gaps in terms of critical and creative thinking. We sent out invitations to 30 postgrads and only 12 pitched up, of which nine were from the science faculty. So it wasn't selected that way, it just ended up being that way. So immediately our data sets a little walk towards science, but it wasn't intentionally that way. We hoped to have 30 postgrads working with us, but only as I say, 12 um, came through. So the leaders were myself and Chris Holtman and Mr. Lawrence Corner, faculty manager, who has an MBA and has done a lot of work in terms of development of people. So we were very happy to have all three of us leading this team. So there were four things that we attempted, uh, or we, we successfully managed to do. The first one was that you don't want to reinvent the wheel. And there's plenty of literature out there that talks about strategies to improve critical thinking in various disciplines in the literature. Our job was to find it. And we, uh, Chris Holtman and a team from postgrad office were very successful from that point of view. We then had an opportunity, Mr. Corner saw that there was, if you want to find out nuts and bolts of something, is you look what the business is doing. Money drives everything, and one of the business programs that was offered in Johannesburg was one on critical thinking in the business place. So I, together with Mr. Corner, we decided one of us must go, and he was able to do that, so he went along and then fed back a, a different perspective on critical thinking. The third one was, creating a critical thinking environment. And that was a very special occasion. We spent a whole day working together, thinking critically in a group. And the level of deep thinking that emerged from that was really quite spectacular. So that became a very important thing for us to remember going forward. And then finally, we had to have a product at the end. So we asked the students to reflect, work with mentors, to start talking about critical thinking that they'd experienced in the undergraduate program with a mentor who may not be, who definitely wasn't in all cases, from the same discipline from which they had come or when we were still as doing their research. So we mixed up people, mixed up students with uh, different mentors who were very good leading researchers and they were able to engage with them to write a personal essay on their, their journey. And those essays, um, 12 students came in, six were able to finish an essay and the six essays are reproduced here and Big Ben on the left is going to give his personal uh, story which is very very um, <coughs> worthwhile listening to. So as I said the first thing is as academics 
is that we just don't start something from scratch. You've really got to do the homework and find out how the wheel was invented and uh, what the literature says about your topic. Here's an example. We, uh, Professor Holtman and her team found 43 references in the literature. There are probably a few more, but she took 43 relevant references. And they sat down and they worked out, firstly, what was the definition they used of critical thinking? Um, so if you're not sure what critical thinking is, there's a reasonable definition. And the aims of the research, the methods they used, and the results and the final conclusions. And I just picked one of the 43 articles, and this is the annotated summary that Professor Holtman and her team prepared. And I want you to look at the bottom line. And everything that we ended up doing confirmed exactly what that bottom line says, which I'll refer to uh, at the end of this short presentation. <clears throat> so the question is, people have different views of critical thinking and the process of critical thinking. We are living in an age where all information, not knowledge, all information is available instantly. How do we sift it? What do we do? So this is Mr. Corner's uh, input. Um, and the company that ran this program on critical thinking in the marketplace, the company's name is Leading Edge, and they covered those learning points up there. And I want you to engage with this particular slide from your own self, from your own discipline, those of your academics, but also the young students that are here to engage and think about all of these points. What was interesting out of this two-day workshop were the number of generic ideas that came forward. The first one, the difference between a cynic and a skeptic. A cynic doesn't trust people. A skeptic comes from the Greek word skeptikos, which means an inquirer. So a skeptic doesn't trust statements that are made based on his evidence. He's questioning the actual statement as opposed to the person. So we all know the difference between cynics and skeptics, and as academics we jump between those five or six times a day. The next one is what characterizes a critical thinker. So in your discipline, think of the critical thinkers that stand out and what characterizes her or him as a critical thinker. And we can relate this to our individual disciplines quite easily. So what are the standards set in your discipline for critical thinking? What are the standards that you have to uh, aspire to, to for your work to be accepted in the international uh, literature, for instance. These are things that need to be engaged with at all levels in the undergraduate program. The second, the fourth one is, how do we distinguish between information and perception? Okay, Donald Trump has difficulty with that one. <laughs> and anything that, that one doesn't believe in is false news, but that's not how it should be. If you're a critical thinker, you should be saying, stop, I don't want to go that road, I need to think this one through. Within all disciplines, there are biases, and we have, we're coming into the decolonization, we're in the middle of a decolonization debate, where the bias is heavily in one direction. We need to change that. We also have to work out logical fallacies. Some things are really so good they have to be believed, and you have to be able to unpack those if you're a critical thinker, and say that's a logical thought, but it's a fallacy, and be confident and have the evidence to do that. Then in all disciplines, this is different, is how do you acquire the data and evidence to support a hypothesis? It's different in maths compared to history. So we need to, to really engage as individual disciplines with these generic kind of concepts. And uh, so we were grateful that that discussion was really, really worthwhile. The next thing, and probably for me the most important experience we had in the Project Y team, was dealing with how do you think in a group? And this, uh, we followed a uh, process given by a consultant, Nadia Mason, uh, based on the work of Nancy Klein, which is the quality of everything we do depends on the quality of thinking we do first. How many times do we regret not having thought before we did something? Okay, so we can all relate to that. And the quality of our thinking depends on the way we teach each other while we're thinking. There's no job situation that I know of where you have to think independently of everyone else. You work in groups. And how do you get the best and deepest thought processes going in a group system? So we spent a day 
it was the day just before the big storm came and everyone was had the day off the next day so we were sitting there with wild winds bashing the building and we focused on the process of thinking setting up a thinking environment and we worked all day at this and they, you can look this up on the web but there are 10 different ways of doing it 10 things you have to take into account in a group and agree to certain ground rules as you start the thinking process and it's a very very worthwhile experience and something if we take this forward that i think we should expand and do regularly with our undergraduate students so then there are the students on the right so we linked up the students with the mentors and you can see the mentors on the left and one of them professor cousins is with us today um, and the students then were allocated the, the um, mentor now we, we didn't put pressure on everyone they had to do what we asked them to we requested that they reflect on their journey as an undergraduate student at university of western cape to help us take it forward a number of, of our um, students disappeared overseas they have got jobs over there before it's finished and others are just not able to meet the deadline because of other commitments so we had our essays meet and we then brought them all together and we were amazed, absolutely amazed, as the leaders of this group, as to just exactly what our students, how they were thinking about their journey in a real critical and incisive way. We then set up at the end to bring the first phase to conclusion, this very interesting colloquium, and we had Professor Lawrence Wright talk to us on Karl Popper's Three Worlds uh, intellectually. Uh, very, very uh, interesting lecture, but it kind of brought everything together. And then we had some reflections of the mentor, uh, this case was Professor Brown, and we also then had each of our students who had finished their essays reflect back. It was a very, very inspiring day. So to end off, what did we discover? Well, the first thing we discovered is the students involved in the phase one responded enthusiastically to engagement with academics. And that's something that came over and over again that academics were willing to spend some time with them to talk about things that were outside of their curriculum. They also, that critical thinking is part of a limited number of undergraduate disciplines reviewed. Remember, we had a very biased uh, group working with us in terms of disciplines, but we could see that critical thinking is there, and it can be enhanced, as the students said, we would really much like, would have liked to have these kind of discussions some way through our undergraduate program. The most important thing is there's no simple quick fix formula for this because you cannot think critically in the absence of extensive reading and fundamental understanding of the discipline. You can't come and pass comments unless you've done a lot of work. And that's a real fundamental of critical thinking. I'm sure Prof Ben here is going to underline that as well. And then as I've mentioned twice now, the quality of thought emerging from critical thinking environments uh, was clearly evident. So putting people together to think together is a very powerful way of developing these skills. And if you get into the literature, all the disciplines, there are in the education literature especially, um, strategies that people have tried to enhance critical and creative thinking within the undergrad curricula. Looking forward, one person or two or three of us can't drive us to the university, so we need champions. And the DBC has commented that for some departments or faculties to run with us and say, let's try and see what we can add value to. And <clears throat> to try and embed this so that we become known for a university where the students stop and think things through and don't follow um, the first thing that comes up on Wikipedia or on Twitter. So I'm going back to that final line that came from the one paper that I chose as an example of the literature, annotated literature, the opportunity for dialogue, the exposure of students to authentic or situated problems and examples, and mentoring will have a positive impact on critical thinking skills development. The interaction between academics and students outside of a formal classroom situation can have enormous benefits for driving this project forward. But as academics will say, when do we get the time and amongst this, this and this to do that? So it requires academics who are dedicated to throwing open the doors of critical thinking and coming up with new ideas and new ways of doing. 
So that's where I end. And so what I'd like to do now is introduce one of the mentors of the essay, um, Professor Ben Cousins, who's going to give a short presentation to you on what it was like to be a mentor during this project and some thoughts on critical thinking.